what type of documentation should I be organizing as I'm building my company in the hopes of being acquired one day? This is a fantastic question. So uh, uh, I could I could almost spend thirty minutes talking about this topic alone, but let me try to uh, let me try to be brief. When it comes to the documentation that you should be organizing, uh, well, let me actually take this from a different tact. So, one of the most stressful periods of my life, period, was the the due diligence process I had to go through. When I was uh, when I signed my LOI and was working towards my definitive purchase agreement to have my company get acquired, due diligence is a nasty business uh, in the sense that you have to document every single part of your business to the 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 smallest degree. So it's I kind of equate it to opening up the Komodo and everyone's you know seeing every scar and and sort of weird bump on your body. Uh, if that's a little bit gruesome, sorry and. Um, you know, I probably wrote an e- easily 150 pages of documentation uh, when it came to uh, describing all the, the nuances of my business, how it operates, the philosophies and principles by which we handle clients, uh, client interviews themselves, uh, and even explanations of previous lawsuits. It, it's a nasty business. And the only way that you're able to succeed is by being organized and uh, having a good online data warehouse which you can easily share with your acquirers. So um, <clears throat> uh, let me talk about organization a bit. I'm a big fan of Dropbox or Google Drive as being uh, a viable place to, to house all the, the content around your business. Make sure that you have that neatly organized. Um, some things that you should definitely have well documented and organized. So make sure that the paperwork is is all set with your secretary of state uh, uh, where your company is is incorporated, so make sure that you are up to date with things like your statement of information filings, IRS filings, uh, whatever kinds of supplemental paperwork that you need to provide on a quarterly or annual basis or or biannual basis. Uh, that can be nasty. Uh, it, it's really hard to understand what you need to be filing and when. And uh, there's some level of expectation too that you don't have to be 100% perfect, but the more perfect you can get, the better. Um, in terms of other critical documentation, make sure that you have your bookkeeping software running like a champ. So for most entrepreneurs out there, um, most of you are using QuickBooks. I, I use QuickBooks online to run my business for the last eight years. And uh, being super clean about your, your expenses, uh, your bank accounts, your revenue coming in, uh, that is very, very important because you're going to have to run tons of reports for your acquiring company. Um, Something I will mention too, so I hate it when I encounter entrepreneurs who intermingle personal expenses with their business expenses. Uh, If you're doing that, I recommend that you go to your local bank that you want to work with and create a separate bank account, create a separate credit card only for business expenses. Do not intermingle intermingle, your, 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 your personal meals or your personal trips to to Disneyland uh, for the hell of it uh, with your business account. Don't try to write that off. You want to be as clean as possible in making sure that your business entity is separate from your personal entity as much as you can. Um, That becomes very important. And then uh, last but not least, um, I will say that an area where I had a ton of pain was around the the choice of accounting method that I selected in uh, in running my business, so I operated my company as a cash basis accounting method, meaning uh, as soon as you, as soon as I received the money, and I deposited it, I recognized all the the, the revenue. Now uh, that that works for a lot of small businesses, majority of small businesses, but when you are getting acquired by a company that will no doubt run by a accrual basis accounting method, they'll bite you in the ass pretty seriously. So what I mean by that is, let's say that you uh, are B2G my client, you're paying me a year in advance all up front, let's say $12,000 for a campaign. Um, on a cash basis accounting method, maybe I could just deposit the check and say, hey, I made $12,000 in revenue, yay. But in a accrual basis accounting method, we may want to uh, uh, amortize that ac- across the entire year. So 1000 
uh, $1,000 each month being recognized. And that's the way that most public companies and big larger companies operate. So tying this all together, where you start to encounter pain is going back for the entire 10 years of running your business and trying to sort out all the revenue recognition issues uh, for campaigns that you run for products that you sell that can become a very nasty business. And as a result, I've heard of uh, some of my entrepreneur friends saying that they have spent over $100,000 paying an accountant to clean up their books so that it was an accrual basis accounting method form that was easily uh, translatable and uh, workable with the acquiring company. So think about accrual basis accounting. Um, if you don't know what that is, you may want to go online and take a quick uh, accounting 101 course just to familiarize yourself with that. Or save yourself the brain damage and just find an accountant who can help you get set up with that and work with your accountant. Good questions, guys. I'm seeing a lot. Um, <clears throat> so I was talking about the uh, the law of diffusion of innovations and the and the early adopters and, and early majority um, or or innovators and early adopters. So uh, you know any any given sense of the population, you've got this bell curve and you've got um, you know kind of the innovators and early adopters way on the edge of the bell curve, and uh, you may be building the product for that mass majority people, but uh, when you're first starting out, those aren't the people who are going to care enough to try your product. Like they're the people who are going to be like, Oh yeah, I've heard about that thing. I should, I should try it. But the people who tried Twitter early on, I was not an early adopter of Twitter. I was like number 14 million on Twitter. It took 14 million people to use it before I was like, all right, I get it. I should probably try this thing. So clearly not an innovator or early adopter when it came to Twitter, but the people who were like the first hundred or the first thousand, uh, those are the guys that you want to tailor this to. And those are the ones who care so much about the product and frankly, probably want some features and things that your vast majority won't care about down the line. And that's okay. You can start out making something that's just so awesome for these people who care so much. And there's just a few of them that you learn about that. And they're the ones who are going to go out and tell everybody else how awesome your product is. So, you know, over time, you can make the product more open and, and accessible to the majority. And, and uh, Jeffrey Moore in his book talks about the challenge of going once you get to that, you know, you've kind of captured 15 percent of the market, the innovators and early, uh, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the innovators and early adopters. You have to do what's called crossing the chasm. There's this there's this you know, kind of dangerous place where uh, you've got to get from that segment of the market to the majority and and a lot of companies die at that point because they're not able to make the leap they're not able to like kind of make the leap to the to the majority and so the, there is there is a period where you know you're going to have to deal with that but um you know it, it's shown time and time again that the the way to to really focus on it is to focus on that really limited segment even though you may have the majority in mind <laughs>